Great to see you. Whether you're joining us online or whether you're in the room, it is wonderful to see you. My name is Sai and I am part of the team here. Um, and if you attempted to check the cricket score, don't bother. <laughs> but you can now concentrate on me instead. And you can listen to what God's wanting to say to you. Um, I want to ask you a little question. Did you ever have a teacher or maybe a parent who used to say to you things like, do as I say, not as I do? Yeah? That just, that, it always just used to really annoy me. That do as I say, not as I do. It used to really hack me off. And um, to be honest, I think it still does. It kind of hacks me off now, to be honest. The kind of, that, yeah, people who make the rules and then don't do them. You know, imagine if there was anyone around at the moment who made some rules and then didn't stick to them. But it's fine. As long as you've got cheese and wine, it's all okay. Um, but this isn't a political statement. You'll be glad to hear. This is actually kind of more of a statement about the nature of what it is to be human. This idea that kind of, what I want to do, I don't end up doing. And that kind of, that's, that's one of the reasons I think that actually this do as I say, not as I do, kind of really gets to me because I do it to myself all the time. Do you do it? Yeah, yeah where well you sort of say to yourself, I'm going to do this, and then what you do is something completely different. And it just gets really, really frustrating, doesn't it? So often I have the most wonderful intentions when I get up in the morning. You know, I'm, I've, in my mind, I've conquered the day. But by the time I've got to the toaster to make the kids breakfast, I'm like, will you speak nicely to each other? You know, modeling exactly what I'm looking for, obviously. Um, and so this, this do as I say and not as I do, this, it just never works, does it? But like I say, my, my, my main problem is the kind of the connection between what I want to do and what I end up doing, between what my, my head or even my heart says I want to be and what my actions kind of regularly kind of tell me I actually am. And... If you're with me on this, if you're like that, we're going to see this morning why a singular moment in ancient history gives us hope, why it can change absolutely everything. Now, if you weren't with us last week, I'm really sorry to say you missed out. You, you, you missed out on a, on, a, on a cracking morning. The good news is you can catch up online, um, but we were launching a kind of a fresh vision, what God is calling us to, to do and to embody as a church, and um, it is honestly, it's worth checking out if you didn't get a chance to do so. Chris um, Kilby, who's sitting over here, he preached to us, and I just want to take a moment to, to honor the gift that he is to us as a church. Okay, because it's really easy to kind of take stuff like that for granted and to take people like that for granted. But um, it is honestly an absolute joy to be on a team with Chris. Um, he is a brilliant leader. He is a, a visionary. He is someone who cares more about what God says than he does about what anybody else says. And that is a good thing to have in somebody who's leading a church. Okay, I want to assure you of that. It is, it is of paramount importance to Chris that we do what God is calling us to do. Not even necessarily the most sensible thing to do, but to follow what God is calling us to do. And I want to be part of a church that is led by somebody like that, don't you? So I want us just, just to, to honour Chris. And one of the ways you can honour him is by listening back to that message last week. Because I know that he poured himself into that and it kind of it, it oozes out of him. That we should be a church on a mission together doing what God has called us to do. So if you haven't checked it out, please do. And if you know other people around the church who haven't yet seen that or listened back to it, please do it. Because it's going to be one of those things that kind of gets in us. You'll hear this, this phrase, bringing life to every community, a lot. And so that's what we're doing. We are Life Church Southampton. And the aim is that we are bringing life to every community. That's, that's the vision. It's what we're focused on doing. It's kind of the thing that, that we are uniquely called to do in the city of Southampton. There's loads of churches. There's loads of churches doing wonderful, wonderful things. But our bit is to do our bit. Yeah, that makes sense, doesn't it? We can't all do everything. It just cannot happen like that. And, and I really love this statement, bringing life to every community. I've been kind of sitting with it for a while, um, probably quite a lot longer than, than most of you who heard it last week. And 
And the more it's kind of got into me, the more I've thought about it, the more and more I kind of go, yes, this is good. This is a really, really good thing for us to be kind of holding to, for us to be working on. Um, and I kind of, I really love words. I love what words mean. I love what they kind of connote to different people. All the stuff around words, they do something in our hearts. And I think with this, every single word is just full. Okay, the, every word of this, bring in life to every community, it's, it's full of stuff. And in a sense, that's what we're going to be doing over these, over these weeks of this series of bringing life to every community, is, is kind of squeezing these words of everything that's inside them. Um, but for me, it's kind of the, the bringing, as Chris talked about last week, it, it makes it clear that we have something. You can't bring something if you don't have it, can you? That's literally what it means. You, you, you bring it because it's yours to bring. And so that's what, we, that's what we do. You can only bring what is yours already. And to bring it, you can't just stay where you are, can you? That's just holding it. It doesn't say holding life away from every community. It says we are bringing life to every community. So there's an element of kind of going within it. Then there's this word life. And we're going to spend a bit more time looking at that uh, today, and then James Hatch is going to be continuing to explore this theme next week as well. Um, but I, what I can assure you of is that it doesn't mean opening a franchise of Life Church near you. That's, that's not what we are about. That is not what we are about at all. It's not like kind of Greg's or Costa Coffee. We're not, we're not about branding and things like that. It does mean bringing something of Life Church, but the thing of Life Church that we have means so much more than just a brand of church. And we're going to see that a little bit later. And then this little word, two. Two. It's, oh, it's two words. They're two letters, even. It's so small. But even that, it kind of it tells us that impo- something important for us to do. We are called to go to these places. We're called to go to the communities around us. We're called to go to our neighbors. We're called to go to the people on the playground. We're called to go to the person on the other side of the office. There's a, there's a going that's inherent within that word. And then... It, Every, every, there's nowhere, no one, and no type of person that is off limits. The gospel is for everybody. It's for every community. Wherever God leads us in the city of Southampton, and in fact to the nations beyond, we're going to go because he's leading us. And as we heard in that song from um, The Battle Belongs to the Lord, if he's, if he's calling us to do something, then we're going to follow him. We're going to do what he has got for us. And then the word Community. Community exists out there. You, don't, you know that, don't you? We don't have a monopoly on community. We're not the only people with community. There's lots of community. In fact, there's lots of thriving community all around our city, united around all sorts of things. The park run will get you fit, but it won't give you the life that Jesus has got for you. You could, you could follow a, a certain band around. You could have some amazing nights at some gigs, but it, but it won't give you the life that Jesus gives us. You could even have kind of shared experiences and groups kind of united around things that maybe you faced. And it might help you make sense of some of those things, but it won't give you the life that Jesus has for you. And so that's what we do. There is no, there is no community on the face of the planet like that of the church because it has the very life of Jesus Christ, the very Son of God at work in us. Whole communities can and will be transformed through the life that we find in Jesus. And that's, that's what it's about. So we are bringing life to every community. And so now that I've spoiled what the, everyone else is going to say for the next few weeks, we'll get to what I'm talking about this morning. Um, now, you might not know it yet, but the, you, there's a reason that you're here this morning. Whether you come every week or whether this is like you just thought, oh, no, I, th- I think I'm just visiting. When, when God presents a vision to you, when God does something in your heart that says, this is something bigger than you, and it needs your part in it, then we kind of find ourselves getting caught up in something that maybe we didn't even intend. Maybe you've completely not intended this morning to be part of something so much bigger, and yet God is drawing you in. God is saying to you, I want you to be part of this community. I want you to, to be on this mission with these people to bring life to every community. Because there's people that you know that I don't. There's communities that you're part of that no one else in this room is part of. And Jesus is calling you to help, hit, to help us to bring life to that community. And so I want you to be all ears on that. So this morning we're going to look at, at why following Jesus means that we have life. That we have life that we can bring to these communities. And 
how when we bring that life, we do it through, through love, and we do it through care for one another. And so Jesus says very plainly, you'll probably know that he said this, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Okay, so Jesus says, I am the life. So what does, that kind of, what does that mean for us? Well, it means when we say we are bringing life to every community, we're not just thinking of this. We're not thinking life church. We're not just thinking of what happens on a Sunday morning when we're bringing life to every community. It means we are bringing Jesus. We're bringing the risen Son of God to every community that you touch. And that is an incredible thing. We bring Jesus to whoever we're with, wherever we are, and whatever we are experiencing. He is with us. Now, if you've got a, a Bible, I'd love you to turn to uh, John chapter 13. It's going to come up on the screen as well, so you can see it on there. If you haven't, don't worry. But just to kind of give you a bit of context for what we're about to read. So Jesus has been having his last supper with his disciples, his friends, that he's spent his, his three years in ministry with. And... Um, he's, he's kind of been telling them what's going to go on, what's going to happen next. And then he's also told them, someone from within this group is going to betray me. And then he's, he's, Judas has given it away. The disciples don't even quite get that Judas has, has given himself up as the traitor quite yet. But that's the kind of the context that Jesus then says these words. And you'll probably know them. But Jesus tells his disciples these profound truths. And we're going to pick it up at verse 34 from chapter 13. And Jesus says this. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And by this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. So this this new commandment that Jesus gives, it's, it's fundamental to helping us understand what it means to be a Christian. Okay, so if you're kind of on the edges of of faith, looking in, thinking, what does it mean to be a Christian? Jesus sums it up here. He says, love one another. Just as I have loved you, love one another. That's what it means to be a Christian. That's what it means to follow Jesus. And he says to his disciples then, and he says it to us now, just as I have loved you, so you love one another. Which kind of forces us to ask a question, doesn't it? The question has to be, well, how has Jesus loved us? How has he loved us? And therefore, that helps us to know how we can love one another too. And thankfully, John, who wrote John's gospel, wrote another letter later on, and he kind of answers the question himself. Uh, So in 1 John 3.16, he says, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Simple answer. So Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you. How do we do that, Jesus? Lay down your life. He says, He goes on to say, we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech but with actions and in truth. And so the very core of all we are as a church, everything we do, all exists around this central tenet that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. We've sung about it loads this morning. Esther came and brought us a word about Jesus. That one of the, one of the cultural things that you will spot and hear and feel and, and kind of just taste is that we are all about Jesus. He is everything to us. And the central thing for us is that he laid down his life for us. Now, I, I am pretty sure someone would have told you that before. If you've been around Life Church for any length of time, you will have heard that many times over because we're all about Jesus. And the greatest thing he ever did was lay down his life for us. But it's really easy to become quite familiar with that, isn't it? To just go, oh yeah, yeah, I know know that. I've got that one. I could answer that in a quiz. What did Jesus do? Laid down his life for us. I've got that. But when was the last time that really got into you? When was the last time that you thought to yourself, Jesus, this, this man who is God, actually died for me? For you. Because we kind of need to let this hit home personally. As I said, this, this very son of God was sent from heaven on a rescue mission to die. He, he chose to suffer a brutal death on your behalf and on my behalf. And if, if we've grown used to that fact, Why don't you even just now, just ask God, God, would you just help me realize that afresh this morning? 
Help me to just remember the reality of what that means. All, we, we can't even in this, in this moment, even if we spent the rest of today, we couldn't unpack all that that means, but we can definitely remind ourselves. We can definitely turn our eyes again to Jesus. You see, the whole of the Bible is, is focused on this single point of Jesus Christ laying down his life. The whole of the Old Testament points to it, and the whole of the New Testament expands on it. It is the single point in history that everything works to. If this doesn't have a personal application to you, if Jesus Christ dying for you just doesn't kind of have a personal resonance to you, then the whole of the Christian life makes no sense. And it's impossible. And you're wasting your time. This is the thing that matters the most. Paul puts it in his letter to the Romans like this. You see, at just the right time, while we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. For a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Yes, in a collective sense. But also in a very personal sense for each and every one of us. And this changes everything. The demonstration of God's love for us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for me and you. And if, you, if you've never experienced that truth setting you free, if it's just kind of a, a piece of knowledge that you had about this guy in history, then, then you can ask God to help you today. You can ask him by his Holy Spirit to come and just awaken that in you. If there's anything in you that wants that to be true for you, that you kind of go, I, I know it, but I don't know it, you can ask him by his Holy Spirit to come and do that in your heart today. And it will change everything. If you want to chat to me about that or one of the team at the end of the service, we would love to pray with you because it's our greatest joy. And so remember then that this, this charge that Jesus gives directly to us is to love one another just like he's loved us. And so we see these verses that say, this is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech but with actions and in truth. And so knowing this then, knowing that, that the way that Jesus has loved us is that he laid down his life for us, he now calls us to do the same for each other. We want, I want to just see a few things. Two quick things and one slightly longer thing. And one really quick thing before that. Jesus doesn't say, lay down your life for each other, as in physically. Okay? He doesn't mean that, that we should all just actually do what he did. One sacrifice for all time was done by Jesus. We, Jesus no long, God no longer requires burnt offerings. So if you're, just, if you're gradually just burning yourself out, thinking that that is pleasing to God and pleasing to his bride, the church, you've got the wrong idea. It's not a sacrifice in terms of slowly killing yourself on his behalf. He doesn't ask you for that. That was a very quick thing. The first of the other things is this. It says, the lay, this laying down of your life, it, it's, it's giving up your life that is purely for yourself. And it clearly says to us that it's done for our brothers and sisters. So it's a, it's a clear mandate in this, this new commandment that Jesus lays down for us is that the laying down of your life is something that you do actually for other believers. Which sounds slightly counterintuitive. Especially when we're talking about bringing life to out there, to every community, that Jesus' commandment says, for your brothers and sisters. John, ex John explains this. In fact, the whole of the Bible is, is really unified on this. That we are to lay down our lives for those closest to us, our family in the church. Which, as I say, sounds counterintuitive for the church to do. You know, someone once said that the church is the only institution that exists entirely for the benefits of its non-members. And I think that's true to an extent. It is true to an extent, but at one point or another, all of us were outsiders. All of us were outside the church, and then at some point or another, maybe in the last three minutes, you've come to a saving knowledge of who Jesus Christ is, and at that point, you are now part of it. You're part of the church. You are brothers and sisters. You are part of the family of God. And so once we've realized that, then the idea that we should do things like laying our lives down for our brothers and sisters starts to make a little bit more sense. 
But it can still seem a little bit wrong. It can still seem like, yeah, no, but we should be doing it for, for the people who are out there. But let me just explain for a moment. You see, like I said, the Bible is consistent on this whole idea. Yes, we love everyone. Jesus is clear on that too. But there's a special thing for us to love the church. And in fact, our first priority should be loving those in the church. Well, why? Well, because if the church is a healthy, living, thriving family, well, then the church can do and be everything that the church is meant to be and do. If we neglect the church, we all suffer. And as a result, the gospel suffers, and then we don't have life to bring to every community. Our first priority should be the church, and it should be those sitting along your row or behind you or in front of you. Not in a selfish way, but in the same way that if you don't look after your own body, you can't do anything that God has given you to do. We should look after ourselves. We should make sure that we're keeping ourselves healthy. And in the same way, we should keep the body of Christ, the family of God, healthy in the church. Loving those in the church is loving those around you in the world well. Second quick thing, there's a material reality to this. Um, it's, not just, it's not just turning up on a Sunday and having good intentions, okay? Kind of thinking the best of those in church, just looking around you and going, oh yeah, they, they, they seem nice. It, there's a material reality. It says, if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, then the expression of the love of God that is in them is to do something about it. Well, so can we, can we as a church meet every single need in the world? No. Can we even meet every need in the city of Southampton? No. Can we meet every need on your street? No. We can only meet the one single need that every single human being has, and that is for the love of a father. That is for a relationship with God. That is to be rescued and set free from the sin that so easily entangles them and set free to a life of, of freedom. But you see, the Bible also teaches us that we can meet the needs of others in our, in our fellowship, those attached to Life Church, those somehow connected in maybe with you or with one of our ministries. Maybe it's through our little life ministry to the, to the toddlers. But we can meet some of those needs. We have something called the Life Support Fund, which is where we, we give some of our money in to be able to meet needs as and when they arrive. So we've done the things like buying a fridge for a family who needs one when theirs just goes kaput. We've done things like helping with bills for those amongst us who just haven't got the, the budget this month to stretch to that because things are difficult. We've done things, even this week, we've, we've found accommodation for a family of refugees who had nowhere to stay. And we've put them in touch with, with services who can help them in our city and they're now on their way to being able to find somewhere to be able to live for their family. Our life support fund enables us to do things like this. And our loving of each other and those who we know is a witness to a watching world that says there is something different. There is something different in this community. You see, when we had nothing to offer God in return, he laid down his life for us. He gave everything he had on our behalf. And so now he says to us to do the same. And it is as simple as that. We lay down our lives and even the things we have for others because it shows Jesus and we're all about him. And so the third thing then is this, and where we're going to spend a little bit more time. John teaches us, dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. And for someone who does a lot with words and speech, this is a challenge. But it says to do things in action and in truth. And so... I kind of got to thinking about this. Your actions and your truth. Well, what are your actions and your truth? And I think it pretty much just adds up to life, doesn't it? The things you do and the things you think and believe, that's your life. That's the, that is what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. The things you do flow out of the things you think and the, the things you believe. And so that adds up to your life. And the word for, for truth here is used in the sense of kind of what is most real, what is most true. When, when everything's kind of tested, what is truly underneath, that is the, the truth, your actions and your truth, what is kind of there in you. Not just your intentions, because like I said earlier, I have loads of good intentions. But when it's really tested, what is the truth of my, of my life? What can't actually kind of escape notice when people see who you are? Even if you try and present something different, what is... What is really there in you? And that is our life. 
So actions and truth, and an action clearly is something that is done. An action is not kind of, like I say, a good intention. It's not something that you dream or fantasize about being or doing. It is something that you actually do. I'm a really, really great Christian in my head. But my actions don't always match up. And that's a real challenge. It's not do as I say and not as I do. This is the things I say I do. See, I'd be, I'd be willing to bet that we all know someone who talks a really good game. In all sorts of scenarios, maybe it's that person at work who like, is always in the boss's ear or when it's time to kind of talk around what you've done that week or something, they're always chirping in with things that they think is a great idea. My dad would put it like this. He used to say that people are all mouth and no trousers. A Texan might describe it as being a person who's all hat and no cattle which I also quite like. Um, and the TV show The Apprentice, I think, is the best modern-day example of this. I actually had to say to Joe the other day, I cannot watch this anymore, because it just makes me really, really cross. Some of my favorite quotes from people who are talking absolute nonsense and backing it up in no way whatsoever are things like this. I think outside the box. If I was an apple pie, the apples inside me would be oranges. <laughs> what? I can taste success in my spit when I wake up, which is gross. <laughs> I'm not a one-trick pony. I'm not a ten-trick pony. I've got a whole field of ponies waiting to literally run towards this job, <laughs> which makes no sense. <laughs> that one from Stuart Bax, the brand. Um, the problem is, like I said, though, at the outset, we all do this. We all kid ourselves, and maybe we don't go on national TV and <laughs> say these things out loud, but, but we often end up living frustrated lives because of the gap between what we think about ourselves and what we end up actually doing. The life we want to be living and the one we end up with day by day. And the choices that we actually make often don't match up with the intentions we set out with. Our actions don't match our truth. And it can be incredibly frustrating, can't it? Galatians 2 verse 20 gives us kind of an answer to this conundrum that we all face. It says this, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, the answer to our frustration is not try harder. It's not do better. It's not find a new system to organize your life. It's not... Be more productive. It's not diary better. All of those things might help, but the answer is to remember that it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. It's the only way to live at any kind of peace because it helps us to see we can't do it. We're never going to attain to something until we see him face to face. And so for us as a church to outwork this vision of bringing life to every community, we need to understand the life then that we are bringing. See, the life that we bring is not, in fact, our lives. That verse has just told us that. If we try and present to the world around us some kind of shiny version of, like, the best version of you, all we're going to end up doing is attracting a whole bunch of people who want to be a bit like you or me. And I'm not that great. I don't want people to be like me. There are times I don't want to be like me. I want people to be like him. I want people to be like Jesus. You see, if you've put your faith in him, if you've put your faith in Jesus Christ and you are a Christian, your life is now inextricably linked with his. It is, in fact, one. Your union with Christ is a profound and deep mystery that you could spend the rest of your days trying to figure out, and I suggest you do. But you won't ever get all the way there. But it will change everything. You see, the most profound sense you are uniquely and inextricably, like I say, just united with him. Your lives are one. You know, you can't, you can't pick up and put down Jesus. You can't have Jesus on a Sunday, but not on a Tuesday. It's impossible to, to have him at life group, but not on a Friday night with your friends. If that's the reality, you don't have Jesus. You've, you've, you've missed something. He is either everything or he is nothing. And that's really hard. Because even I kind of go, oh, there are times when it, it, he's nothing. 
But his grace comes to us every single time and welcomes us back in. Paul writes to the Colossians and he says like this. He says, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Everything you are is now hidden with Christ who is seated in the heavenly places. You are in him. You're not just occasionally with him. You are in him. You are united with Christ. Paul goes on to use the phrase, Christ, who is your life. That's about as deep as it gets, isn't it? It's not just something we kind of occasionally choose to be, like when we go, oh, I was a a really good Christian today. No, he is your life. It's just an extraordinary thing to say. And so I guess the question then we need to ask is, well, what does Jesus Christ's life look like? If Christ is my life, what does his life look like? Because that's the life that I now have in him. And Jesus says his life looks full. In John 10.10, he says plainly, I have come that you might have life and life in all of its abundance, overflowingness, fullness. And that's what we're about here at Life Church. You see, I think a full life looks like, I think it looks like broken things or hurting things being restored and brought back to a sense of fullness or wholeness. And it also means that all of life is on the table. There's no point pretending that there are things in your life that are all sorted when we all know we're we're all struggling. (laughs) We all struggle in all sorts of different ways. And that's why we come together. Not to look at our mess, but to look at the one who gives us life. He's not on the screen. Don't know why I keep pointing up there. But we look to him and only him. There's all sorts of of other places in our city and across the world, actually, where you could go and you could attend. You you can be a bum on a seat on a Sunday, but that is not what I want to see in our life church family. This is somewhere where, like I say, everything's on the table. If you're a mess one week, great. Come like that. If you're on top of the world one week, great. Come like that. If you're somewhere in between, great. Come like that. There's no pretending here. So when we say bringing life, we mean we're bringing our lives. And life is messy and difficult and fun and full of joy and full of difficulty and full of other people who make it really hard. Bring all of that. Because what we do here is we look to Jesus who says, I'm going to give you life and life to the full. And I'm going to give you my life. Over the next uh, few weeks after this series, we're going to be looking at the way of Jesus, what it means to, to follow him in just a few different aspects of life. We're going to have a few series across the, across the year that help us to kind of just really focus in on what it looks like to follow him. But I think just two quick things that I wanted to focus on this morning. One, care for others. And the second, love for others. As we saw in that verse, that's what Jesus tells us to do. As I said, fullness, I think, means that broken things are restored. And I've, I've felt broken very recently. And, and others around me have, have loved me and have cared for me and have helped me to, to come closer to a place of, of fullness again. And I know that that is the testimony of loads of people across this room. Just looking at you, I can, I can think of times when, when life has been hard. And others around you who I'm also looking at, I can think of people who've gathered around you and supported you and upheld you. The tender, loving care of Jesus, our shepherd, brought to us by friends and family around us who just keep pointing us towards him. That is our pastoral care model. (laughs) Keep pointing people towards Jesus. There are specific situations that we can help with. And so we have a a pastoral team, um, a wonderful group of people. And we're going to be working on expanding that team across our sites. There'll be a, a, a pastoral team who look after the site that meets at Cares, a pastoral team that look after the site that meets at Lord's Hill, at West End and at the Boathouse. And then there'll be a, a kind of a pastoral hub, a central hub, which all of those teams relate into for particularly tricky situations that maybe just need a little bit more expertise. But there's one thing I want us to understand about having a pastoral team. They're not a SWAT team. They are not going to parachute into your bedroom and suddenly fix everything. They might have specific expertise. They might have specific things that they can help you work on. But the command that Jesus gives us is not email the pastoral team. The command that Jesus gives us is love one another. One another. All of us. 
And so I want you to, to just think about that for a moment, because the reality of pastoral work is, is really just walking alongside someone and pointing them to Jesus again and again and again and again, and you can do that. Because you need other people doing that for you too. You can email the pastoral team. You can speak to one of your life group leaders. They are great places for you to connect into the help that, that being part of a church gives you. And if there are specific situations you're facing, I would love you to do that. But I also want you to think about who can you care for? Who's, who's in your life that just needs an encouragement to keep looking to Jesus? Who's facing some stuff in their lives that could just do with your encouraging word? Or getting them to church on a Sunday? So Jesus' command to us is to love one another, not to simply refer people on to somebody else. And so another place then that the fullness of life is outworked is in our life groups. It's a place where we get to love one another because there's, there's all sorts of people in them. And all sorts of people requires loving people because people are different to you. And that's a great place to learn what it means to, to do what Jesus did, which was to hang out with other people and to, to look to him. So if you've not signed up to one, can I encourage you to find a life group? Not because we want to tick a box that says, oh, we've increased our life group numbers by 3% this term, but because it's a place where we get to know one another and we get to continually point each other towards Jesus. I'd encourage you to invite friends along to different groups as well. It is a great thing for you to do. But can I just encourage you, three points of action. Don't, don't talk a good game. Don't set out with good intentions, even from some of the stuff I've said this morning. There are three points of action you could take this morning. The first one is this. I want you to consider who, who you are caring for. Because if you're taking seriously the, the command from Jesus to love one another, there'll be somebody around you that you are bringing care to. And if you can't think of anybody, join a life group. And you'll find some people. Make some friends with people in a church and you'll find some people who need your care, who need your love, who need your message on a Tuesday to just see how they're doing. Maybe if there's other people then who are caring for you, you could thank them for that. There's people who I need to say thank you to because I know that they are caring for us as a family at the moment and we appreciate that. So first then, consider who you're caring for and thank them for the people who are caring for you. Second, join a life group as an intentional step to love one another. And thirdly then, not just action but in truth, we need to let the deepest needs of our heart be met in Jesus Christ. That is your third point of action this morning. We're going to sing again in just a moment and we're going to take communion together, which is a, a symbolic reminder for us of everything I talked about in that Jesus is ours to have. We can come to him. We can be united again with Jesus Christ continually. And we remember that through taking communion, through the bread and the wine. And so I would love to, to pray for us for just a moment. So can I encourage you just to stand to your feet and I'd love the band to come and join us again. If you, haven't, um, if you haven't got a little communion cup that you could have got on the way in, don't worry, there's a, they'll be on the box down here. There's a little bag down here that are gluten-free ones. And if you're joining us at home, then you can, you can join in with whatever you've got there too. But let me, let me just pray for us. You know, sometimes it helps me to just put my hands out and say, God, I, wanna, I want to receive from you. So if that helps you, why don't you do that? And if, that, if it's something you just need to do in your heart, then just open yourself to what God might want to do now. Lord Jesus, I thank you that your life is a full life. Lord, that your example to us of loving one another, of, of caring for others around you, of showing that, that deep brotherly love for, for your immediate close disciples, for the three, for the twelve, it was an example to us. Lord, and we want to, we want to look to you as our as our older brother, someone that we look up to, someone that we want to follow and be like. Lord, we thank you for your care for us, that you walk alongside us through all of our brokenness, through all of our mess, and that you keep calling to us. You keep bringing us back to yourself. And Lord, we pray for us as a church that we might bring life to every community. Lord, that we might bring the, the truth of who you are to the city of Southampton. 
to the person who works on the desk next to us, to the person who lives over the road. Lord, we want to bring your life because it is the greatest gift that we've ever been given to be found in you, united with the one who holds all things. Lord, what a privilege it is to be known and loved by you. Lord, I pray by your Holy Spirit, if there's anyone here this morning who doesn't yet know what it is to be loved by you, to be united with you, to have you as our life, would you just awaken their hearts in this moment? Even as we sing these songs, God, would you speak your truth to them? Lord, we invite you by your Spirit now to come and do your thing. Amen.